So with this bench press example that we're gonna be going ahead and having you guys break down, okay? So you've got this 20 centimeter lever arm. We're gonna say the actual upper arm itself is gonna weigh about three kilograms. Kitty, I know, oh my God, guys, I'm sorry. My penmanship on the whiteboard is, uh, leaves a little bit to be desired. Then the form itself, we're gonna say, is gonna be two kilograms, okay? Center of mass in the upper arm is gonna be half its distance. So 0.5. And the pec itself is just going to be inserting about, it's a, well, actually probably only about two inches down the arm. So we're gonna say this is going to have an insertion right here. That's going to be effectively, we'll say, Five, oh my God, guys, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go grab a corded mouse. Five centimeters. And then from there, it's gonna be pulling in probably what's gonna be only maybe a 15 degree angle. Good morning, take your sticker. So the first thing we gotta do is set that up, okay? So think about the lever arms, think about the forces, and work our way through what's going on. So we're only going to be lifting with the pec. We've got the weight of the upper arm pulling ourselves down. We've got the weight of the forearm pulling ourselves down. And then we got 100 kilograms on the bar pulling us down, don't we, Jinx? Now, with those 100 kilograms on the bar pulling us down, we're doing the bench press with two arms. So we actually are only lifting 50 kilograms per arm. But we're going to set it up so that we're going to have the force of the pack, which we don't know, multiplied by the force arm, which is going to be that 0 0.05 meters or five centimeters equals our effort arm, which is going to be 50 kilograms multiplied by gravity, 9.81. So we got that in Newtons. And then multiplied by, we're spazzing out a little bit now, this is fun, uh, 0 0.2 for the actual effort arm, plus the two kilograms, because the weight of the form and the hand that we have to lift, multiplied again by gravity and multiplied by the 0 0.2 meters, the 20 centimeters, because we have that effort arm, and then adding the last one, which is going to be the effort arm of the upper arm itself, which is going to be equal to a grand total of the three kilograms multiplied by 9.81. And since the center of mass is half the distance of the arm, you're gonna multiply that by 0.1. Yes, you never get enough attention. This is just, it's like living in a Romanian orphanage. There's just nothing going on. It's all sadness for you. My cat's a little demanding if you haven't noticed. Okay, so give it a shot, guys. Put it up in the chat what you end up with or what you're seeing, and then we're gonna go ahead and talk our way through those numbers. Yes, I know it takes a little bit. That has to work this morning. Yes, if you keep wiping your face along my arm, it's going to totally allow me to focus so much more on petting you while I'm trying to work. Okay, you got your early morning attention. Okay, I gotta work now. Yes, there's the Eye of Mordor for all of you guys at home. Okay, so now I have a mouse, so this should make this a little bit easier. Okay, so we're gonna end up here with the basic formula of our X force multiplied by, hey kitty, 0 0.05 equals, you are such a butthead sometimes, cat, 50 kgs times 9.8. <laughs> this is why I don't plug in my other uh, keyboard because she's literally walking over it while I'm trying to talk to you guys. 
good kitty. And she's now a fork kitty. Times 0.2 meters plus open two kilograms times 9.81 times 0.2 meters plus, and open parentheses again, guys, a grand total of three kg times 9.81. And remember, guys, all these are going to be in meters per second squared. And then multiplying that by our 0.1, because the center of mass is midway through the upper arm. Okay, now once we've solved for that, the peck force itself, remember guys, it's going to be on a 15 degree angle. So we're going to have to figure out what is effectively the vertical component of the force being produced. So that's going to give us effectively the sine of 15 degrees equals this pec force above, because that's the actual lifting force that we're looking for. And the hypotenuse is actually going to be giving us what we're really trying to get at, which is our full force we're producing. No worries, Haley. So for this example, I'm just saying that your center of mass is effectively going to be just that 50%. So if you think about the shoulder, the elbow, the center of mass of the arm in this example, I'm saying is 50% of its length. Now that's why we've got those formulas for you guys to use that I showed you guys the links to and then the uh, documents that I've got up in Blackboard for you guys so you can figure out what the center of mass should be for the limbs typically and also just the part of the limb you're looking at because that's going to allow you to figure out okay if we know the center of mass so where it would effectively spin around not that I want to chop off my arm and see where it would rotate but that's going to let you know then whenever we're setting up these formulas effectively where we're going to see all of that force does that answer your question Haley So. Dr. Dr. Lane, this might be a, not a good question, but the 9.81 meters squared, is that the, is the meter squared the units or do we square the 9.81? Okay, okay, so that was just to remind you guys that the units for acceleration is 9.8, is meters per second squared. Okay. You don't have to do that. That was just to show you it. Thank you. So you, weren't, you guys weren't all like, why does it keep multiplying everything by 9.81? It's just, we're doing this on earth gravity. You know, I thought I'd get a mouse and see if it would make my writing better. I don't think it's really made my writing any better. So whenever you guys Think you have the answer, go ahead and throw it up in the chat. Okay, so Braden, I'm converting everything from centimeters into meters. That's okay, Haley. So the peck itself, it has to lift this arm up, okay, because the arm is actively being obviously pushed down by the weights all around it. So we need to figure out, since the pec doesn't actually attach in a way that pulls straight forward, the pec pulls in. So it has both a horizontal and a vertical force vector. Now the only force vector that matters right now is that vertical force vector, the one that's actually lifting the arm back up. 
So we're going to go ahead and take and figure that angle is only going to be like maybe 15 degrees because it's not a steep angle if you hold your arm out to the side and you look at your pec. It's pretty flat. So most of the force your pec is actually producing is pulling your shoulder into the socket. Only a small amount of it is actually pulling your arm forward to lift yourself up. So that's why we're going to go ahead and use sine because we're looking at the vertical component, not the horizontal. I know what I need to do. Here it takes. Look out the window. Or look underneath your mom's elliptical. What are you looking for? Haley, does that explain that a little bit more to you? And John, that number looks relatively realistic. There you go. Now the kitty's looking out the window, so she's all types of happy. So keep running the numbers, guys. You might not all agree with John, and that's fine, but I want to see at least two or three more answers before we're going to move on. Okay. Is it 7.297 or is that 7,297, Luke? That's okay. That's why we talk through it, guys. It's easy to start working on these problems and then forget about, you know, your order of operations. So in this example, since we've got the weight of the bar, the weight of the form, the weight of the upper arm, we have to figure out the sum for the weight of the bar, then figure out the sum for the weight of the form, then figure out the sum for the weight of the upper arm. If we try to just run them all together of doing plus and multiply, plus and multiply, your calculator is going to give you a massive number in that it's going to think you just keep adding and adding when that's not really what's going on. And Tink's back. Good morning. She has a strange fascination with our printer, which is kind of funny. On occasion, I just print something off just to freak her out. As the cat almost knocks over my laptop because she does not do a good job of walking under the stand. <laughs> Excuse me. Sneeze, not a cough. We're fine. Because somebody likes to put their pet hair in the air everywhere. Oh. Well, that was a mistake. Okay, so, Braden, once you solve for the peck force, you're going to enter... You're gonna take, okay, so this I didn't finish factoring. So we're gonna be left with a final equation of the hypotenuse equals that peck force that you solved for earlier. I swear English is my first language, guys. Sorry, the cat is headbutting me while I'm trying to write. And back to the floor, kitty. Force it also probably doesn't help that I'm doing this with my right hand and I'm left-handed. <laughs> Divided by the sine of 15. <laughs> nice. Good. So Braden, is that what you got for the peck force or the hypotenuse? <laughs> Good work. Yeah. It, you guys are always going to have probably little differences because of the rounding error. Good. Good. So it looks like you guys are getting it. Nice work. Okay. 
So can you guys see uh, all of the participants that are in here today in our meeting? All right, so I want you to go ahead and please remind me guys, put in the chat who all of the people are in your group. So, and once you see somebody else has already put up all of your group members, name in the chat, you guys don't have to do it more than once. And I'm going to put you guys into your groups and I want you guys to take a shot at what we're doing right here. Good. And once you go ahead and take, you know, you're gonna take a shot at this, talking your way through it. Obviously you each have your own joint, but you guys can just start off like, hey, let's just do the shoulder together or let's just do the knee together or the hip, whatever works for you guys. But you guys are gonna do that as a group and we're gonna give you guys probably, you know, well over 20 minutes to really kind of talk it out amongst each other. And I'm gonna drop into each of these breakout rooms so you guys are gonna be able to kind of talk your way through it and make sure that you know what you're getting is realistic because this is what you're going to be using on your project. Um, I'm not familiar with that nickname. Cass, if you don't mind uh, explaining me a little bit better. <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you. No, it's okay, it's okay. All right, so I think I've got everything for everybody that's here today. And obviously not everybody has their classmates for this, that's fine. So you guys focus on just the joints for the people that are here. We're just trying to set up this type of formula, figure out the weights, figure out those center of masses, okay? Doesn't need to be perfect, but this is gonna give you guys a good first run of it and something we're gonna be able to talk our way through. And the first thing you're gonna do is just solve for the amount of force to keep yourself in a position. So you're not gonna rotate. Now, remember, when we think back to those formulas, where our torque and the time component is going to be equal to our actual rotational inertia multiplied by that rotational um, acceleration. So let's make sure that you guys then think about how much torque you have to produce in order to move something that quickly. So. I'll be checking in with you guys every few minutes. We're gonna plan on meeting back. Sorry if the cat's just, yes, yes, we know, your life is trained. Um, we'll see you guys back at about 9.15, you, or sorry, 10.15. You've got plenty of time. Yes, thanks, yes, I know, I know. I'm home this morning. This is why I lecture from the office, because then I know I have everybody on me.
I'm sure I'm recording that, with your arm straight behind you, you've got the weight of that hand all the way out there, the weight of the forearm further away, so those effort arms become longer. And so that's what's really tricky about this stuff is when you're thinking about how you're moving from one position to the other, which is, well, here is harder to move my arm than if I have my arm here at the shoulder joint because I've obviously shortened up those effort arms. And it's even more of an issue, obviously, when you then think about, you know, you have an object in your hand to make that a little bit heavier and then kind of where that's at as you're going forward. So right here, because the effort arm, because we're, we're looking at it, it's a horizontal axis because it's really gravity that's pulling us downwards. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on for one moment. And we're back. Okay, that was not fun. All right, so when you have your arm go, let's say in this 45 degree angle, your effort arm is not equal to the length of this lever. Remember, it's equal to the perpendicular force components. So it's not gonna actually be as heavy until whenever we're in that fully lengthened position. Does that make sense, John, as you're moving through? It does, it makes a lot better sense. And so with like resistance arm then would be the vertical component of that 90 degree angle? Yeah, yeah, so that would be, you know, here would be the actual resistance arm. Is that actual length from your center of rotation? Because it's where those forces are perpendicular. That, that makes more sense. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, in fact, um, Cass and Juliana's group, they were asking questions about doing the snatch or the clean. So, wherever you guys are at, you just make sure you're in a position where you can lean forward. So, when you're standing up, okay, so I'm standing upright, you know, gravity is trying to pull me down into the ground, but it's not very hard for my back to keep me upright because it turns out my center of gravity, you know, is through my hips through the center of my rib cage, through my shoulders, through my head, because I've got you know, decent posture. But as soon as I push my butt behind me, let's go ahead and show you guys what you didn't want to see anyways this morning. Me, higher definition. So if I'm standing upright, as soon as I push my butt back, I can feel how it's harder for me to keep an upright posture because I've now got a larger lever arm so when I keep pushing my hips back, I increase that lever arm and that weight pulling me into the ground. So I've got to do more lifting through my, or new, more force production isometrically through my lower back to keep myself from rounding over. So that's how you see that lever arm naturally increases based upon me moving. When determining center mass, how many joints are needed to determine the amount of force inflicted on the lever arm? I like the term inflicted, that's, uh, that's pretty intense. Now, here's the thing, whenever we're looking at, you just need to figure out what all's being lifted by that joint, okay? So in the hip example, my hip is lifting my torso, my arms, my head. All of those are gonna have their own center of mass. So if I'm in this position and my arms are dangling straight downwards, their center of mass is effectively going to be being perceived through the shoulder. When I put my arms backwards, now their center of mass is going to be based upon where their center happens to actually be as far as their center of mass. It'll probably shorten the lever arm. And then if I go and I ride the roller coaster and I put my arms up in front of me, that center of mass is now gonna be higher, probably closer to my head 
making it a greater amount of force I need to produce. So that's why your hip and your shoulder are pretty damn strong compared to when we go further down, like when you look at your wrist, because they have to lift the entire arm and everything else in between when we're producing that force. Okay, so force equals mass times acceleration times distance. Not necessarily. Instead, remember, this is a leverage formula, Juliana. So we're going to be going and we're looking at simply our effort times our effort arm equals our resistance times our resistance arm. So our resistance times the resistance arm is all of the different resistances we're adding. So make sure that we're trying to add in all of those components. So if I had a barbell on my back and I was doing like a good morning, you know, the same basic hinge type position. Well, now I've got that extra external load on top of the load of all of my body parts that is being lifted by my hips. Does that make a bit more sense to you guys? Are you referring to the shoulder example we were working through just a moment ago, or are you referring to your example? Okay, so Juliana, whenever we're doing the snatch, you're going to have, especially in that start position, you're gonna have the force, okay? Whenever we're bent over, we're in that start position. You're going to have the Effort arm of the center of mass of your torso, effort arm for the center of mass of your head, effort arm for the shoulder multiplied by the mass of the arm because the arm is going to be in line with where your shoulder is at. And then we have the effort arm of the shoulder because that's where our hand is going to be grabbing onto the barbell directly underneath of us. So effectively, you've got four different things you need to break down. you will be factoring in the amount of weight in the hands when you're pulling the bar off the ground. Like I said, so that's four. You've got the torso, the head, the arms, and then the object being lifted. Does that make a little bit more sense, Juliana? Cool. If it seems complicated, guys, it's because it is. So, do you guys, would you guys like to work in your groups a little bit more? Would you guys like me to work on some other formulas in front of you? What are you guys in the mood for? And I like how one of the groups is still actually working as a group that get to join us, which is awesome. Okay, so Catherine, go ahead and let's walk through your guys' example. Which one are you guys doing? We had kicking a soccer ball. Okay. So we were looking at the hip. Okay. Oh man, you guys are gonna make me look like an idiot. I mean, sorry, you're gonna make me look great. So we've got leg number one that now looks broken. Okay, we have soccer ball. We have leg number two. I think your drawing is beautiful, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> That's bad. Okay, so now here's the thing. This would be obviously at the end of the windup. So we would have started you know, you'd step into the ball, your leg underneath you. So you're initially going to have this backward action when you're lifting the leg up. 
Now, remember, we're going on the horizontal, which is where we need to break everything down with. So it's not the true full effort arm of the length of the thigh, or the, yeah, the thigh to the knee. It's going to be that effort arm part. So yeehaw, you gotta make that right angle triangle, and you have to figure out your angle here, and then you're gonna actually figure out how far that's gonna be displaced. Now remember, the center mass of the thigh is gonna be about here. Center mass of the lower leg is probably gonna be about here. Norm, screw it, buddy. And the center mass of the foot is gonna be about here. Norm, do you want to say hi to the class? You want to say hi to the class? Yeah, come on. There you go. There you go. Everybody, this is Norbert. Yes, I know. I know it takes you got pets all earlier. He loves everybody. And he finally got up and started moving, so I thought I'd introduce you guys. So you're going to have to figure out then, okay, so let's say we're talking about the glutes lifting the leg. So the glute itself is actually going to attach into the hip. So it's got this nice, long, big angle of pull and into the iliac crest. So you got to figure out the effort arm there. So this is one that's mechanically not bad if it wasn't for the fact of how long your leg is and it has to lift it. Now, you're going to have to add in that sum of the weight of your thigh, the sum of the weight of your lower leg, the sum of the weight of your foot, the effort arms for all of those. And so depending on how well bent your knee is, and how well bent your foot is, that's gonna equal you have to produce more force. So if instead your knee was only bent like so to come back, you can see how we would increase the length of those effort arms, which would actually make it heavier to lift. Are, am I making sense right now, Catherine? Yeah. Does it look pretty complicated? Very. Yes, because it is. And that's okay, guys. That's okay. The goal with this project is to really introduce you guys to how we're going to break down these movements and trying to think about how much force you need to produce at different points in the range of motion. I don't expect your numbers to be perfect. What I instead really am looking for is the fact that you guys can break these things down theoretically. Because Oh yeah, and the other thing that we're forgetting is it's, it's the sport of soccer. We don't know, yeah. I'm really good at drawing cleats, can you tell? So depending on the weight of the shoe, that's gonna add some extra weight. Depending on the weight of the shin guard, if they're wearing one, that's gonna add some extra weight and all those are gonna have to be overcome. What else can I help you guys with? Okay. So since you guys are quiet and I want to introduce the other part. Now remember our torque is going to equal our rotational inertia multiplied by rotational acceleration, which is a lower class A. What are we supposed to do with those angles? So braiding from there, that's gonna help us solve what's gonna be our actual distance, so our radius. So what you guys have to figure out is that inertia for all of this. So where is the center mass of the overall leg going to be? And what is that amount of mass going to be? Because we've got M, times k squared equals our rotational inertia. So if you're going to go from, let's say the back of this point here, okay, we're sorry, your leg extended behind you like we've drawn it up. I'm pantomiming it, but I realize you can't see me doing that, which is, yeah, that's abs obviously absolutely fine. Okay. So if we're going to figure, let's solve for the center of mass of each of these segments. Now, what did you guys come up with? Did you guys, for the weight of the thigh, weight of the lower leg, weight of the foot, were you guys able to solve for that on your own?
Barely. That's kind of what confused us. It's okay. It's okay. So let's break it down. So the first thing we need to do is we'll use that math part to solve or like the formulas you guys have found online. I have a PhD. Can you can you tell? Uh, the link and everything you need is going to be in the blackboard slides you're gonna be able to find Cass. So we have to solve for each of those, which is going to be the center of mass. Okay. That we've got and then the length of that lever arm. So First, we need to go ahead and we'll just say that your hip here, it's a 45 degree angle behind you. The reason I picked that is that one's really easy to break down. Since it's the right triangle, obviously, and it's a 45 degree angle, we're going to have the same lengths of both sides. So the sine or the cosine of 45 ends up being about 0.72. So if we take the thigh, and let's say it's, just to throw out numbers here, it's 20% of your body mass. So you take that 20% of your body mass, and that's gonna give us the actual weight of that segment, okay? AKA, we've got the mass over here. We then have, the distance that's going to be where the center of mass is going to be on the thigh. So we're going to take that distance and since we're doing a 45 degree angle, okay, that equals a 0.72. Otherwise we just say sine of 45 because the hypotenuse, which is actually what we have, that's the actual length of the thigh. So it's sine of 45 multiplied by the distance is going to be equal to the actual perpendicular force production. That's a seven. Okay, and we're gonna do the exact same or close to the same thing, only now, notice we've got the shorten and the shorten. So that makes math really wonky and really hard. That's fair, because then we're gonna figure out, okay, effectively how far would this knee joint be in this 45 degree angle, and then do the 45 again for the, essentially the calf. And then we gotta do it again of where this happens to be distance and then where this happens to be distance when you're thinking about once again doing 45. So it's just adding, adding until effectively we have the radius. So you're gonna have to come up with three radiuses and three individual masses when we're looking at the lower leg. Once you found each of those centers of gravity and the masses, we can effectively kind of take a bit of a weighted average of each of them because we're we have all those individual inertias so we're just going to add them all together so we're going to have the inertia that we're getting from the thigh the inertia that we're getting from the calf and the inertia that we're getting from the foot summing all those together to get the big eye inertia and once we sum those then we just have to figure out our acceleration and so for this example, that's where you're going to have your video where you're going to watch it and then measure it and figure out, okay, well, how many degrees we, we, at the end of the phase, when you've got your leg pulled back, your velocity is zero. Okay. So then how quickly do we go from that point to the follow or to effectively kicking the ball? So for our force producing, that's going to give us a positive acceleration. So we're going to have that acceleration to so mean degrees per second. So we're going to multiply the sum of all of those inertias by that acceleration, and that's going to give us our torque we had to produce 
through the glute, or sorry, and this one would be uh, through your hip flexor because it's pulling you forward. Ask questions, guys. Yeah, Braden. So it's it's rough. So effectively, what you're doing is you're taking the length of the thigh. So this is going to be you know from the hip to the end of the knee joint, and you're going to be multiplying that by 0.72. So you get this distance here. Then you're going to do that same center of mass times 0.72, and that's going to give you the calf center of mass. And then in order to figure out the foot center of mass, you're going to take the, the length of the thigh times 0.72, the length of the lower leg times 0.72, and then once you add those two together, you're going to add that final what will be, since it's another right angle that we're effectively saying we're here, of a grand total of that distance times 0.72. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Why do you think this is a project you do over the entire semester, guys, and you only have to do one joint's worth, and we start working on it at the beginning of the term? So. It's 1045. Thank you guys ever so much for bearing with me with the wonders of lecturing from the house. Norbert was very happy to meet you guys, I guess, kind of for a couple of seconds. And, you know, Tinks is just her wonderful, normal self, currently cleaning herself again on the couch because she's along here and that's pretty much what she does as a full-time job. So if it was 20, it's probably 20 centimeters not long, not 20 meters long. That's a pretty damn long thigh. But you would do 20 times 0.72, then, yes, 14.4 times 0.72, and then add whatever that would be. So remember, we're looking, when we're adding on the next segment, okay, so the thigh, we just need to take that 0.72 of its actual center of mass location. Whereas when we want to figure out the center of mass for the calf, in this example, we need to take the length, the full length of the thigh times 0.72 plus the center of mass location of the calf multiplied by 0.72. Guys, we will keep working on this as long as you guys want to. Okay, don't get nervous about it. Just stay with me. Bring your questions. We can start off right where we're leaving off here on Tuesday. I've gone over, and so I'm not going to take up any more of your time than I already have, but 